So we get to Lithuania, play my first game. All I start hearing is... <laughs> so I'm thinking, brother, is that monkey chance? So first touch, monkey chance. It's like, nah. Anyway, two minutes later, I get the ball again, monkey chance. I'm like, oh shit, this is monkey chance. So five minutes go, I start hearing zigger, zigger, zigger. Shoot the <laughs> Nobody just turn around and say, yeah, yeah, just turn up and be you. It's a lie. We all know that. And I don't care if it's a cameraman, a chef, a teacher, nobody has just turned up and got it. They've grinded. Every single person that's wanted to achieve something has grinded. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Getting Back Up with me, Anthony Agogo. This is the season finale already. I can't believe it, the big season finale, the crescendo, the climax, and who better to end on than my mate, Bayo Akinfenwa, the cult football hero. This guy is a superstar, a genuine superstar in the world of football and sport and, and social media. He's a larger than life character, so charismatic, so funny, so kind, so wise. He's, he's a really intelligent man. He's lived an extraordinary life had so many ups and downs and setbacks and said to overcome so much. Now, Bayo, he is by far the most famous footballer in the UK never to have played in the Premier League. He's already fam more famous than the most Premier League footballers. Why? Because of him and his aura. And if you haven't heard of him, then I'm sure you're going to fall in love with him like the rest of the country have. This podcast is one of my most favorite podcasts I've ever done. Bayo, he's an absolute legend. He talks so honestly, so openly, with such humility, and this pizzazz that he has. And when you listen to this, you're gonna know exactly what I mean. We focus on a particular time in Bayo's life. You see, Bayo got rejected. He said he got nose after nose after nose from so, so many football clubs growing up as, as a teenager. So Bayo had to do what most people don't do. Went to Lithuania when he was 18 years old, tried to make it as a pro footballer. Now, when he was there for two years, he suffered the most horrendous racial abuse. A big black man plying his trade over in Lithuania. And he talked about some of the struggles and, and, and the setbacks that he faced. And it's, it's all inspiring. It's really awe-inspiring. He says some unbelievable things that we can recap at the end of the podcast. This is this is this is ending Black History Month here in the UK. This isn't really about race, this this podcast at all. It's about a man, a big, strong, charismatic man going through setback after setback and refusing to give up. As I've said, it's one of my most favorite podcasts I've ever recorded. You're gonna absolutely love this. I'm sure you are. I did listen to it four times now. It's a banger. Please, please, please enjoy it. Learn from it. Get inspired. And without further ado, let's get stuck in. A quick heads up. This is an emotive podcast. We talk about very emotional things. And the language does get a bit colourful. I've asked my lovely editors to, to bleep out the naughty, naughty words. So there's nothing really too bad. But a quick heads up, you know, this is very, as I said, a very passionate conversation. We talk about one of the hardest points in somebody's life and they are very emotional about it. I get emotional too. But with that being said, I know you're going to really, really, really enjoy this podcast. There is so much inspiration sprinkled from the first minute to the very last minute. Mate, so listen, thank you for coming on today. Blessings. This podcast is called Getting Back Up Again okay. with Danny Ogogo. And this is all about, listen, I talk to people... Um, that have made it in their lives, right? People that have overcome adversity, that have struggled, that have faced setback after setback and always got back up and achieved great things. And listen, your career, that is you. Yeah, yeah. This whole thing is you, man. Like, I listened to your book uh, this week, on, on audio book, and, man, what a career, what a person. Uh, wow, I just want to inspire the world by your story. Yeah, yeah. Because your story, man, you've you got a special story. And you're here, you're the most charismatic person I know. Full no, stop. Second, bruv, second. Mate, full stop. Bruv, I know you, cuz. It's the second, it's the second, it's the second. <laughs> Listen, I'm, 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 I'm just honoured to have you on today, so thank you for coming on and sharing nah, your man. story. It's a blessing, it's a blessing to be here. Thank you, my brother. Very welcome. Listen, so, your book, right? right. The first page. From Hackney Marshes to the hallowed turf of Wembley, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, yeah. Talk to me. 
you know what? Of course, I think everybody who has a dream, you, you, you dream for the highest. There's no point having a dream if it's just a mediocre dream. A mm -hmm. dream is that, you know what I'm saying? To get to as high as the point as you can. And growing up, Wembley's that. It probably still is now for every young kid to go and play at Wembley. And I, listen, to be able to do it, to be able to score, you know, sometimes you're just like, oh shit, yeah, yeah, like I did it. So I remember when I started the book, it was it was the back at, um, at the end of it was the back end of just doing it coming winning the playoffs, and of course that's still to date it's the highest achievement that I achieved. To that's your Mount Wembley. Everest in your sporting that, career. That, that's my Mount Everest in the sense of see my most proudest moment is becoming a professional. That's my most mm. proudest because I keep. I've got tingles. I've got honestly, mate. I've got tingles. You saying no, that? No, the reason why I keep saying this, right, and. It's funny because you started off saying about, you know, my stories to inspire, this is about adversity, this is about getting up. And it's crazy because I believe everybody has got an autobiography, everybody's got a story. Yeah. And I just feel that what differs is just some stories are, yeah, you know what I'm saying, they have a bit more oomph to it. But I honestly, a teacher that was told they can't teach or couldn't read and then overcame that and then became a teacher to teach kids. For me, that's as big a story yeah. as a professional that broke his leg and came back. So I believe we've all got stories to tell. Of course, some have got more glitz and glamours mm -hmm. than others. Mm -hmm. But I believe, like, one, I, listen, I am part of a massive world that everybody has got an autobiography. So my greatest achievement, hands down, was becoming a professional because I remember at the age of five, I said, yo, I want to be a professional footballer. And anybody that's got a dream and then that can go and achieve that dream, that has to be the pinnacle. Then, of course, you have sub bonuses, which scoring your first goal, making your first assist, playing at Wembley, meeting your idols, all that stuff comes in as subheadings. But you're to be able to say, yo, I did what I set out to I did do. It. Yo, it's the biggest thing for me. So, yeah, be. So that's where the book started. It was like, yo, from Hackney Marsh, that's where it started as a kid. And then, boom, to Wembley. You know, sometimes just like, yo, man, like, we did this. Man, this is going to be a good one. I'm already excited <laughs> because it's the thing, like, you said something very important, like, everyone's got a story, right? Every, everyone, no matter who you are, whether you're a homeless man on the street, whether yeah. you're a woman working in Tesco, like, everyone's got a story yeah. and you can be inspired by anybody. Yes. It's whether you've got the the foresight or the wherewithal to look for that, yeah. right? And, like... I know, I know you, you know my story quite well, but yeah. I had to retire from boxing after hurt my eye. I had nine surgeries in three years, and I was fucked. I was fucked. I yeah. was, I was, I was depressed. Yeah. I was struggling. I was contemplating ending it all. And I used to look at my mum, right? And my mum, she raised five kids on her own. She worked full time. She never took a hand out. Like that to me is so inspiring. Yes, you know, like, and everybody's got a story to tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about whether you're willing to look for or not and take inspiration from that. So, and you're, listen, going into your career, you never played for England or never played for Nigeria. Yep. You never scored a final in the FA Cup or, or you know, or whatever. But Are you what trying you... to build me up or shut me down? No, 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 no. What the that's fuck? What <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. But your, but your story is so, is so yeah, because yeah. of that, you're so, because of that, right? Because of that, you are one of, and I, I'm not even putting a ceiling on this, because of that, you're one of the most beloved footballers in the country. Say nothing. Because, because you're real, right? You live in the house with your missus, you got your kids. You struggled the way we struggle. Yeah, yeah. Like, normal, like, it's hard to relate. You're, you're a footballer back in the 70s, right? Where, like, there was normal people. Yeah, they, weren't yeah. earning, they weren't earning 100 grand a week, 200 grand a week. But you know what the baddest thing is, right? And, and one, I'm going to take that because... I, I always and that's meant as a compliment. That's yeah, and, 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 but this is what I'm saying. I'm going to take that in a sense where I, I really don't care what... and this is, I don't really care what people perceive of me as long as they say, you know what, B is authentic. I can mm -hmm. only be me. You yeah. understand what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So that I fucking love. I actually get that. I actually get when people look at me and they're like, right, oh, this boy ain't built to be a footballer. But when he talks, he gets excited and he gets gassed and, you know, he's meant to be a professional footballer. But but when he met the Klopp, he was screaming. And when he met Gerard's shirt, you know what I'm saying? He was the guy. Yeah, I'm a supporter. Mm -hmm. I am... But I... I, I but on the, on the flip side of it, right, I also feel that, and I can only talk about football because it's the industry I know and it's, it's the industry I'm in. I believe because these certain footballers get paid that, they don't perceive as normal. 
that's the thing where I... And, and that's it. It's like, of course, sometimes people may not be able to relate to somebody like Ronaldo. You know, he's the elite, but uh, hundreds of thousands, millions a week, and be like, nah, man, he's not normal. And But the worst thing is, he, all these footballers here... Like, they are normal first, but I think as soon as they can put football in front, yeah. it's all of a sudden, it's like, oh, no, we can't relate with them. Yeah. They don't have normal problems yeah. because they get paid that sort of pee. So, on one hand, I get it. I actually understand it. When I mean I'm just a brother from the ends, I'm just a brother from the ends. Like, when they try and put, oh, yeah, you know, celebrity, I'm a, hey, drop that shit out, you know what I'm saying? I'm literally strip everything away. I'm going to be the same individual I'm here from when I was at Hackney Marshes mm. and now when I'm, I, I, I do the EA stuff. I'm the same brother. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and I'll always say this, of course, a 21-year-old Akin Femma would be talking different from a 38-year-old Akin Femma because we're a product of our experiences. It is where it is. But I'll always try and say that I stay the same. I've stayed the same, but I've become more and more comfortable with who I am. And I think that's, for me, I think that's the key. I actually think it's the key. I think... I think being included is a hell of a drug. I think everybody now, especially with social media, everybody wants to be included. I think when you get to a point when you're comfortable, you're like, yo, I am who I am. And that at the end of the day is out of every journey, story, autobiography, by you, Mumsy and the sister, you've been the one common denominator in your story. So you have to be comfortable with yourself. Because when, you, when you're not, that's where I feel the problems lie. So just touching on that point in the sense where I do think some footballers or footballers in general get a bad yeah. get a bad tag because yeah. I feel they feel that money and success is the root of everything, which don't get twisted. It helps. You know what I'm saying? Give me Ronaldo's money. I'll take it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I do think even with that, and that's why you'll see people that's got P that will still have mental problems, that yeah, will still... They will turn around and be like, well, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. How are they going through that when they've got that? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is, but not contradicting myself, I totally feel when people then do chat to me or see me play or be there like, yo... It, it, you, I can relate to yeah. this brother. Do you know what it is? It's, it's a lot, and I've, I've been there in sport and elite sport. I've seen people become successful. I've seen people do interviews when they're 18, 19, and they're just young and they're just boxing and they box because they enjoy boxing. Yes. I've seen them become 30 years old, multi-millionaires, world champions, and then the guards come up. Yeah. And it's not necessarily their fault, right? But, like, and, and obviously let's talk about football because that's, that's what you did, but, like, a lot of those players that earn a lot of money and have a lot of fame, they do withdraw and it's not their fault, but because everyone's trying to catch them out. They, they can't go to the shops and buy, buy a magazine without people taking pictures of themselves. So I understand why they, why they get withdrawn. But the thing I set you aside from basically any other sport that I know is you said it yourself and you know exactly who the fuck you are. Yeah, yeah. And you're and similar to myself, I know exactly who I am. I'm very comfortable in my skin. I can say what I want. I can do what I want knowing that I am me. And you are you, and people are endeared by that. People love that. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Ogogo Fitness. Ogogo Fitness is my brand new fitness app I'll be launching really, really soon. I've created this app so I truly want to help people. I believe everybody should have the right to exercise and be fit and be healthy. I brought this to the world to promote physical health and mental health. I've designed 60 preset seven minute workouts ranging in difficulty from round one, which is pretty easy to round 12, which is really, really challenging. As well as that, I've got my personal workout builder. I've created 50 different exercises and you have the choice to create your own playlist from the 50 different workouts, which gives you an option of over 80 million combinations of workouts. So from your GoGo -Go Fitness app, you can literally choose for millions and millions and millions of workouts personalized for you and what you're training for. So head over to agogofitness.com, register your interest and be the first to know when Agogo -Go Fitness is launching. So BBC Sports Personality of the Year, well, I always think, I always think, fuck, like people are used to being that. Because you're a personality. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Your personality. Not people who have just done the best thing in that. You see people, footballers or ten, not football, tennis players or, or Formula One drivers or whatever, they've had a great year, great season, they've won it, and they win the BBC Sports Personality of the Year. They should win the BBC Best Sportsman of the Year or Sportswoman of the yeah, Year. Yeah, yeah, My personality, you're a true personality. Yeah, like, no, listen, like, listen, I get it, you know what I'm saying? And if you want to give me the accolade, I'm going to take it, you get me? Um, but no, do you know what? I, uh, 
it's funny because you there's two things you said which are I'll, I'll say I do believe those that are coming up I think when you're coming up and whatever it is you're you're liked or you've got potential and they want to get behind you they do whatever they can to build you up but once you get to the top they do whatever they can yeah, they drag to drag you down, you down. Yeah. so it, 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 it's a, such a mind-boggling thing so I get it when them and them have reached that pinnacle where they're like raw of these people that were saying all of a sudden all this all the good things about me, all of a sudden, right? These motherfuckers, they 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 want to take this shit away from me. Yeah. So you're like, uh, you know what? I, I don't want to put my energy on you, which I understand. Only difference is with me, I keep saying like, but and this is not to disrespect my career at all, but for my sport, I didn't reach the elite. I didn't get to the Premier League, and that's what I aim to. The highest I got to is the champ but I didn't get to the elite. So I, it's weird because I also feel that, you know, I am a real individual, but for them, they're like, well, you know, he's not earning the, fat, the hundreds of them, the millions and that, so we cool. So, and, and this is the crazy thing is, but I don't yearn for the spotlight. That's not what I do. I, I, I keep saying this, right? My greatest fear is to not be able to take care of my kids. I'm a father of five. My five kids, I'm hands down my greatest achievement. That's all. The, that's what I care. I care about being me, taking care of them, and then what comes comes. Yeah. I feel like it's that I don't. I mean, I don't yearn for that glitz and glamour. I don't. Want, I don't want them to try and put me up and then try and drag me down. I, yeah. For me, that's not for me. Like I, I, I believe like the key of life is to be able to achieve the things you set out with the people that you roll with. Mm -hmm. That I think's the key to life. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And that's for me is what I be trying to do. I like look, um, I'm. I'm cool in any walks of life. Like, I kick it in the hood, I kick it in corporate. I'm cool in any walks of life. I will chat to the CEO to the same that I'll chat to the next man off road. It, yeah. it, I, for me, it's not, I'm not defined by my status. And I keep saying this, it's like, I, I am an individual and I'm true to me. And that's, for me, that's all you can be. But like I keep saying, I'm speaking this at 38, being through yeah. a product of my experiences. A 21 year old, I confirm I wouldn't be saying this. Yeah. I just think that, when you get older, and you will know this full well, like, there's things that you put weight on, like, oh, it's the end of the world. I, I can only go, I'll bring it back to a football game. Oh, I ended up, we lost. I played crap. They said I'm not good enough. Oh, and you think, oh, shit. Takes away your whole weekend. Yeah. You know, you play a game on Saturday and then you don't recover to Tuesday because you're in your thoughts and that. And as you get older, you start, you know, for me, my turning point was my first kid, didn't it? And then you start realizing, wait, hold on. But it's not just about me, you mm. know what I'm saying? And then you start feeling, wait, hold on. These people that are trying to critique you or criticize you, or especially with social media, like, I wouldn't even take advice from you. So why would I allow your negativity to penetrate my soul? 100%. And then you start, you literally, you start being like, well, when you're younger, you try and impress. As you start getting older, you try to do your best. Because at the end of the day, you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, yo, for me, I know I tried. If I fall short, which I fell short many a times, but if I know, like, oh, you know what, I tried my best, bam, that's what you can do, rather than being come in the room and being like, oh, there's a CEO back there, yeah, or there's the fans are up, man, got to try and impress them and then lose who I be. Yeah. And then when you don't, then you look at the mirror and be like, oh, was you really you? Was you? And for me, that... I say young bucks, the young footballers coming up. I'm like, yo, if I know, if I knew what I know now back then, and hindsight is a beautiful thing. But I'm like, look, find yourself. And it's a hard thing to do. Don't get the game twisted. And it takes, and it takes, as we're talking about today, it takes setbacks and and adversity to find yourself, 100%. right? And find that. My brother, way, I just want to go back. You said so many important things there. And you said so many, you just, you ran through fucking point after point after point. And people listen to this, please go back and watch this two or three times because- <laughs> I'll talk quick, but ba Bayo's ba ba making some fucking <laughs> dynamite points. You said one thing, you're not going to let no fucking, lack of a better word, shit bag on Twitter, penetrate your soul. Mm. Say nothing. Fuck. Say nothing. That was articulate. Back in the day, I would have said, I won't let them fuckers say anything. <laughs> but, but I'm a bit more articulate now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I love that, but that hit, that hit. And you're right, because even now, like, I get the odd person with my, with my wrestling, I get the odd person say, a oh, go goes this, a go goes that. And then, and I don't really give a fuck. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm thick skin and it's water for Doug's back. But if I've had a bad day, or if I'm fucking, I'm, I'm, cause wrestling's hard, mate. Like you, you, you smash your body up, you're tired, your neck's stiff, yeah. you have an elbow in the face. People are calling this, it's calling it fake. And I think I've got a fucking black eye and a stiff neck and it's meant to be fake. Yeah. And then maybe I've had a bad day. And the odd time, the odd time, the tweet will 
Not penetrate my soul, but it'll piss me off. Yeah, yeah. And I'll think, fuck you, but I'll click on this, you know, on, on this picture, and it's a fucking bag of shit. Yes. And I'm like, mate, what the fuck? What do I care what this man says? Percent. Uh, listen, when I'm talking this, don't get the game twisted, right? But this the other day, like somebody tweeted something, and I, I don't know what they said. I uh, this boy is he, he loves the camera or something. They said some shit like that or. Ah, oh, he's getting too big for your boots or some shit like that. Like, like, like nine times out of ten, man are like, of it's cool. It don't penetrate myself, but I get, I'm like, bruv, the audacity. Yeah. Fuck that, yeah. But sometimes, bruv, I'm with my brother. Like initially, when we first went on social media, my brother was, but my brother just used to see comments and just go for them straight. <laughs> what? He would see something and be like, what? Bam! They attack him. They shut your mouth. What? Come see me. Like, you know, he'd, and even him now, but he's like, oh, bruv, it's long. But at the same time, and you know, you know, the, the, the wickedest thing is because y'all see Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson recently, and the worst thing is not like I'm glorifying violence, but he made a statement saying mm. social media has allowed these individuals to feel like they know you enough to disrespect you and no repercussions happen. Yeah. And, and the, the maddest thing is, I, I say it and I use football, right? I remember Rashford did the same thing and apologised afterwards. It was, they were giving him stick, giving him stick, giving him stick, saying shit about his family, saying shit about his mums and that. And of course, like anything, it's his place of work. And if this was any other place of work, yeah. any other place of work, come if somebody came to a bank, come to Tesco, well, they'll call the police. You know what I'm saying? So and or, this get, is what, or, or get or get a broken jaw. Or get a broken jaw, which Mike Tyson seemed to took it upon himself and tucked the brother in. Do you know what I'm saying? Not like I say I'm um, I'm an advocate for violence, but at the same time, there's so many so times you can hear someone like slag off your mum or your missus, though. And, and, so, and that's my thing in the sense where it's coming to the point of. Look, sometimes oh, uh, penetrate your soul. We, we are all human beings, so we get pissed off. So I'm with you, but they'll be saying, but I get it constantly. I get people trying to get at me constantly. But I live by that creed of, but I don't know you. Negativity won't penetrate myself. But there's times when men have to chat back. One brother said, oh yeah, if I can remember can make it as a footballer. Anybody came. And I was like, yo, bruv, I'm glad I gave you inspiration. 100%. Let me know when you make it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you want to dig it. There's times when you can be quick witty with it. Yeah. And there's times when you're like, hey, bruv, mm. bruv, I see you and I see you. And that's just what it is. And that's life. I, I feel like there's life. I feel like there's, there's consequences to actions, both for and against. You know what I'm saying? So the same, we'll talk about the Will Smith. Like, my man said something about his missus. He slapped him. Consequences to both. They're like, he made a joke and he knew there could be consequences. Will Smith slapped him and he knew there'll be consequences. There's consequences in all walks of life. You live and die by your decisions. And not saying it's right or wrong, but to whoever you did it, it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. So listen, sometimes you've got to deal with them sort of situations, mm -hmm. you deal with it, and then you're man enough to take whatever the punishment, left, mm -hmm. right, or center. So, so that's how I live kind of my life still. So how do you <laughs> So how do you deal with, you're just a fat Eddie Murphy? Oh, I can't. <laughs> See, them ones are black. I ain't even gonna lie. Like, all right, cool. I'm gonna walk you through, right? And I, I, I'll touch on this, right? Sometimes when you're going through your darkest moment in your life, it is actually shaping you for walking, when you're walking through the light. 100%. Right? All right, cool. So, and I'll cast you about 18. Wasn't making it here, getting told no, 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 no. Got um, released by Watford, got an opportunity to play in Lithuania. Yeah. At this time, never ever heard of Lithuania. All I knew is they were offering me an opportunity to play, they were gonna pay me, and they played in, in Europe. So I was like, right, cool, football's all I wanted to do. Like I said from five, I said, look, however it takes, I'm going to be a footballer. Boom, go to Lithuania, they offer me a three year contract. So I, I remember at the time, all I saw was they're going to pay me to play football. And the worst thing is I play football for free. When I hear they're going to play me to play football, I'm like, yo, I made it. That's it. Boom. Whatever comes afterwards, comes afterwards. I didn't contemplate, I didn't contemplate the language barrier, didn't contemplate the race barrier, didn't contemplate the culture barrier, didn't con contemplate not liking the food. None of that. They just told me I was going to go play football. That's all I saw. Got to Lithuania. So now bear in mind, 18, grew up in Hackney, <clears throat> went to Highbury Golf School, multicultural, all of that. You know what I'm saying? Don't think I dealt with racists. Don't think I dealt with racists up until 18, all right? 
Boom. So we get to Lithuania, play my first game. All I start hearing is... Ooh, ooh, ooh. So I'm thinking, bro, is that monkey chance? It's like, nah, man, that man, it can't be that. So anybody that plays football, especially pre-season, we didn't play in the stadium. We played in what would be the local team. So that means all the fans are around the pitch. So first touch, monkey chance. I was like, nah. Anyway, two minutes later, I get the ball again, monkey chance. I'm like, oh shit, this is monkey chance. So five minutes go, start hearing zigger, zigger, zigger. Shoot the fucking <laughs> So I was like, zigger, zigger, zigger. Shoot the fucking <laughs> zigger. I, I kid you not, if anybody's seen the films where it'll be like the the, the video pans round, it, that's how I was like, I'm looking around like, bro. Going at half time, one of the brothers spoke English. I was like, yo, what does Zigger mean? It was like, they just rhyme it with the word So I was like, oh, snap. So anyway, boom, come out second half, 10 minutes, same, Zigger's like, I'm coming off. Come off, massive chant, massive roar. Made it worse, it's about five, a thousand people um, chanting. Half of them, 500 of my own fans. So I remember going off, I talked to the CEO of our team and I was like, use his phone. I phoned my brother. I goes, yo, bro, I'm coming home. He goes, why? I goes, right, they're being racist. I remember him saying to me, he goes, listen, B, I won't ask you to stay anywhere that you don't want to stay, but if you leave, they win. And again, movie, there weren't no music playing. I come off the phone and say, fuck that, they've won. I remember going home sleeping, so I'm getting out of it. Woke up the next morning thinking, am I mad? Call it to find intervention, call it whatever. I think nobody's running me out of anywhere. Mm. So anyway, cut long story short. Um, go through the season, score goals. We get to equivalent to the FA Cup final. First trophy that I scored a winner. First trophy they've won in 11 years. I remember opening up at Adidas store, met the mayor. And then, of course, you sit back and anybody that knows, like, this is MSN time, so you know what I'm saying? It was MySpace time, it was Black Chat time, you know, had to go to the internet cafe to talk, laptops were mad money, had to get calling cards, so there was no iPhone, no FaceTime, so what I mean, being away was being away. Away. <clears throat> then realised I was the only black person in the league, one of five or six black people in the city of Clypador. And it's funny, cos I remember sitting down with my chairman who owned a a uh, security firm, and it was called Argos. So he's sitting down and he went, B, do you want two securities to go with you wherever you go? And in my head, I'm thinking, what? You want, why, why would I want security guards? I'm a big brother, like nobody run up on me in the ends. Um, <clears throat> and then I was like, nah, nah. And then he told me, and then the, the week before, they were telling me about, yo, one of the brothers just got glassed. They were, they were in a pub, but they got glassed, but they had the security, so they, and I was thinking, rah. Went to a shop the next day, getting my getting my groceries and a little couldn't be more than eleven came up white power, and I'm looking around like who is this little girl? Am I being punked? I see her parents over there. I, was, I swear down, I wanted to punch up her pops. Just wanted to punch him up. So anyway, goes white power, goes away. All right, reason I tell that story because at that moment in time I was like, yo, shit, this shit here is dark. Like I'm out here by myself. I remember. My brother, he was 14, so he's four years younger than me. I was 18, he was 14, he came out. My missus at the time came out. We went into the grocery store together. So, and it's funny because where you can just get used to something. So now, I've always said, now I'm used to just being watched, walked in anywhere, it stops. So now you, you've got three black people walking in. When I mean the whole shopping center stopped, tumbleweeds went, I kid you not, my, my younger brother, he felt so uneasy. He was like, what, what the fuck? And I was, at this time, I'd become so used to the whole thing. I was, I was desensitized to yeah. it. It was the norm. Yeah. So I'm bopping around like, oh, shit. So my thing was like, yo, listen, but we're museum exhibits. They can look, but best believe they can't touch. That was the mindset that man was moving. But so anyway, what I learned at 18, I learned ignorance is bliss. I still got racist chants from the away fans, but my fans took to me like nobody's business. Oh, yeah. So it showed me that what people don't know, they fear. Yeah. That's what it showed me at that time. Yeah. And then it also showed me that at 18, but if I can overcome that, but if there ain't shit. So now when I go and they say I'm just a fat Eddie Murphy or I can film your tits are offside, I'm like, yo, for me, that's playful banter. Yeah. Like you've you you you've tried. I've had man tell me they wanted to kill me, but because I was black. So for me, my whole mindset is sometimes when you feel like, oh, rah, 
there's no light at the end of the tunnel. When you get through it, of it shapes you for the individual you become. So that's how I deal with them sort of bars now. Mate, honestly. Uh, come on, love. I kept looking at my arm when you were talking, so I'm generally getting tingles hearing oh, you talk about it. Love, yeah. And I knew, listen, I've listened to your book, I've read your book, I'm, I'm not, I knew that. I've written all these points down and you've covered them, you've covered them all. Um, you said the, 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 uh, you said in your book that obviously the, uh, the racial abuse you got on the pitch was, was horrible. Of course it was, fuck. Like yeah, you, yeah. You're, you're doing your thing, you're living your dream and it shouldn't be like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it wasn't personal because, I guess they were far away and you're doing your thing and this thing. But you said when the little girl come over to you and done the white power thing, she came into your space. So it she came to space, you. Yeah. And that one really hurt, right? Yeah. Because because a young girl, a, a kid, came up to you and, and, and with two words made you feel, well, I presume fucking worthless or like it wasn't lone, worthless. lonely. It, it, it made me feel... Listen, I was angry. I, I remember, and I say this, because I remember it there... They were all dressed in black, sort of gothic, and there's a perfume shop. It's crazy. This is over 20 years ago, and I can close my eyes and I can see it. And I remember feeling like, because and it's mad, because I, 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 I joke about being able to put things a bit more articulately now, but see, I'm a father of five. My little man just turned seven, and like I've got an 11-year-old boy and a 10-year-old girl, and she must have been around that age, 11, 10, and the innocence that my kids have is that at that point, I was like, yo, this is 11 year old girl, fearful enough to come in and say white power. Nobody was, it wasn't even like, if they sent her, but, and then put her hand down and went back to her parents. And when I keep saying, I, brother, I wanted, to, I could not put my hand on a little female. I couldn't, I couldn't put my hand on a kid. Of course. So I, I, mean, I wanted to punch up the pups because that's where it came from. But it came from, like you're a product of your environment. Mm -hmm. It came from that. And I, I, so that's where it is. I mean, look, I always say this, isn't it? Like, like you said, on the pitch, I can say what you want to say to a degree. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that you... I mean, it's not right. It's not, yeah, not right, but... but... To, a, to a degree, right? And I, I say that, right? Because in recently, there was a chant going around which it picked up um, about a sex offender. It just picked up. It became a trend. And they, they actually... They, what they just did was put names that rhymed with it and put my name in it. And I got it on one game, I kind of let it slide, got it to... Then all of a sudden, it, beca it became a thing to the point where I had to approach the fans. I approached the away fans. And I was like, yo, it don't stand. So to a degree, mm -hmm. you lot can say, like, I, I keep saying I was at Ipswich, Portsmouth, um, most of the places where I can throw me a tits offside. And anybody that knows me knows I'll play with them. Yeah. But I, I, it, for me, because some people may... It may and the, this is the thing which gets me, right? It is banter until the person that is getting banter no longer says it's banter. Yeah. Period. So I, some people may not even like that. Oh, yeah, you fat bastards, you fat. To them, it may literally hurt their soul. As soon as they say it hurts their soul, you got to stop it. Yeah. I'm not... I, for me, I'm different. I, yeah. I call it banter. And, and you said you said that they did it because... They were only doing it because they were... They, they were scared of you. Yeah, but I seemed like, it was because you were fucking good and uh, you so were a threat. that's where it is. I, and the reason why I say it, you still get, like anything, right? I look at it, what you go to hurt the most, right? And when you're the only... So I was the only black person, so all they saw... No, I meant... So oh. I, meant uh, I meant the Eddie Murphy stuff, your tits are offside, oh, oh. which is funny. Like, you know, oh, a... yeah, and the worst thing is, I, I said it, when they did that, I was bossing up. Yeah. I, like, I turned, I was yeah. like, fair play. As original, fair it's funny. Fair play, exactly. And that's because, that's because like, you... They you don't do th bad players. Exactly, I, I, I yeah. remember saying... I remember manager saying this to me. Yeah. Manager said this to me, he was like, look, B, he said, if them saying shit about you, they don't... If you were shit... They wouldn't fucking yeah. They don't boo bad players, innit? Yeah. So I, I and you've got that, you've got that, that, that magnetism that, like, even, again, and you, you'll know this better for me because you've played week to week for almost 20 years now, but you've got that magnetism where, like, opposing fans don't hate you. Like, opposing fans, they like you. They wish, they wish you on their team. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, look, I get ripped by every fan. Like, you know what I'm saying? So if they like me, they, they don't shut. Now, listen, look, you know what I also I, I feel like I get, and you said it at the top, is... I actually think people relate. You know what I'm saying? Like, look, some people may say, oh, yeah, you know what? You know, he's defying, look at him, he's 17 stones and, you know, he's running around. Some people may say, oh, don't run around, but fuck them. Um, <laughs> but anyway, no, nah, but, you know, so I think some people just like, you know what, it's nice to see somebody that we didn't fit, that doesn't fit the norm, do something. 
So that's what I think I get. I think I, I honestly feel like people relate to me, not in size or, but relate to be like, well, he's different from the norm, but shit, he's going for it. You they know relate, what I'm they relate, and they respect. Like I was, I mean, we've got the, we share the same agent not only for 10, 12 years, yeah. so I knew the Lithuania stuff. I knew yeah, that, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's not until you you hear it, you know, and you can say, you know, you said there's no social media. People weren't seeing it on a yeah, weekly basis yeah, where you go. Yeah. You've come back and you've told people, but to hear that, like, makes your fucking blood boil um, and you your know skin crawl. You know what the thing is, right? The things I'm saying is still going on now. Yeah. That that for me, I remember when them went to maybe I don't want to get there. Mas was it Macedonia that England went mm. and they were talking about coming mm. on the pitch if if it's the wrong place, wrong place. I apologise and that, but. 20 plus years later, these players that I was, they're still getting it now. Yeah. Like, that for me is the thing that's most fucking yeah. disappointing of it. Like, shit, we're 2022. Yeah. And we're still flipping down through shit like that. It's I boxed in a. Uh, so we boxed uh, all, most of my elite amateur boxing career, boxing for Team GB. We traveled Eastern Europe, fucking loads. Lithuania, Latvia, yeah. Serbia, Croatia. And they're all. They're all backwards. Yeah, yeah. They're all backwards and uneducated and ignorant and fearful, right? I remember we used to walk down the high street in Croatia and we'd get this, fuck off this, fucking me and me and one of the boys. Um, I remember I boxed, I boxed a Serbian once in Serbia and I was walking to the ring and some right, some fucking prick, I was walking to the ring, he, 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 he went and I walked past and he spat. Yeah. In my ear, right? And I'm walking, I was fucking livid. I was walking to the ring, and back in the day, I used to wear the head guards. And this big fucking greenie went through the little earpiece that was in my ear hole. And I was walking, thinking, that fucking done me twice. He's called me, can't do anything about it. I'm now walking to the ring, and I've got his spit in my fucking why ear. Did, why at that point could you not have done anything? Because it was the European Championship semi final, and I was solely focused on beating this prick in the ring. And and I mean, I didn't even know it was. I mean, I was so, I was so yeah. fucking, I was, I was, I was honed in. Yeah, and I get yeah. football. I mean, uh, football and boxing. There's, a, I mean, a sport in itself is. There's a lot of similarities across all the sports, but yeah. boxing. I mean, like, it was. I was 16, so I was a kid. Um, it was the biggest thing in my life, beating this guy and winning the medal as the quarterfinals, winning the medal in European Championships meant so much to me. And I'd blocked it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I didn't really hear it, and I heard it, but I didn't want to hear it yeah, on the yeah, focus yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't until I carried on walking two or three steps down that down the uh, down the tunnel, and I thought, no, I can actually feel this guy this this guy spit in my yeah, ear hole, yeah, yeah. and that pissed me off. And then I, I, I box, I, I I lost the fight. I, I should have won. I got robbed. A Serbian in Serbia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're racist and backwards. I got robbed, but still, I boxed badly because I lost my head. And yeah. I learned a lot from that. I yeah. learned. I've been racially abused for all over the world, and like you get it in those countries because they're backwards and uneduc yeah, uneducated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, mate, for me. Somebody who's been there and I was there for uh, on all the different countries for a week or two, but for going there for a year, you're there for a year, year and a half. There for two years. There for two years. And dealing with that, you know, on a weekly, sometimes daily basis, so much respect to I go there. And and I, I read your book, right? And, I, and I've written this down and I um and I and I got tingles right in it. And you I wrote down what you what you what you said. You said on your first day in Lithuania, uh, you wanted to do two things. Win something, which you did, and silence the racists, which you did. But that's that, like, after so much adversity and then to achieve that, what a fucking win. Yeah. Do you know what? It's mad because uh, cause I want to ask you now, maybe not right now, but go 16, give me 10 years, would you have done the same thing walking in a room where he spat you in your ear? Would you have reacted the same? Do you know what I'd have done? If if I'm if if the sixteen year old me then was me now, yeah. then much more wise. I would have kept my head. I'd have kept my head and I'd have boxed really well, and I'd have made sure even with the dodgy judges, I'd, I'd have won. beaten him, right, and that would have hurt him more yeah, than yeah. me. Because what would I have done? I had my head guard on, I had my gloves on. If I chin him, I get disqualified. I'm thrown out of competition and banned from boxing for England for the for, for the rest of my fucking career. If if I hit him and miss, he'd have fucking ran away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd have been a scuffle. I'd have walked to the ring. I'd have got told off by my coaches. I was the England team captain. I'd let myself down, let my country down, let my team down. So I would have just, I'd have, I'd have kept my head. That, that, that taught you would, me. You would have won. 
That's wow. yeah, that taught me yeah. to keep my head, you know, and, and and with yourself as well. Like you learn to, you learn to not rise to the shit bags that are giving you abuse, but to keep your head and fucking and stick to the game plan, right? You know the maddest thing is so off that quote, right? When you say it's a win, what I took most out of that, which has now become the mantra of my life, is I don't do things to prove other people wrong. I do things to prove myself right. That's what you've got. That's it. And, and the reason why I say that, because you actually, I'd always say it's a double entendre because you prove yourself right, you therefore prove those wrong. But you flip it round, you're spending more energy in proving people wrong than you are proving yourself right. Yeah. So you flip it that way round, is, and you concentrate and put that energy in yourself, you therefore are rising above all of that. And in the mm. end, it's just concentrate on you. So when I'm talking about... I wanted to achieve something. I wanted to prove myself right that I could achieve. I wanted to silence these individual racists out there because I wanted to prove myself right because, look, I can be above it. Mm. That's the both things I do. So I got in out of it, and that's him, literally. Mm. From then, he, and this is still in war. Even at 38, even, sorry, at 39, oh, fuck, you know. Even at 39 now, when the man are saying, oh, yeah, you know what, man, you can't play right around. This season still has been my best goals to gain minutes in my career. Yeah. In a sense is, and I do this, I do this for, uh, you know what, I do things to not prove them wrong, I do it to prove myself, to be able yeah. to say, yeah, man, well, I've, you, you can still go and do it. Yeah. And that's literally it. That Because I keep saying, in our journeys, we're that one common denominator. This podcast is sponsored by Oliver Johnson Art. If you've got a friend or family member that's mad about football, then jump over to oliverjohnsonart.co.uk and check out his fantastic stuff. He paints really cool football prints, mugs, coasters of all your favourite football clubs from non-league up to the Premier League. There's over 70 designs to choose from, ranging from non-league to Premier League, Scottish football and beyond. Also, as a valued Getting Back Up listener, you can get 15% off. Use the GBU15 code at checkout to receive your discount. I've checked out the website it's fantastic stuff. So head over to oliverjohnsonart.co.uk, GBU15, get a 15% discount code, and buy some stuff. Going back to the to, to the Serbia incident, had I have chin that <laughs> spat in my ear, then I, like, I might have felt good for a second, but I wouldn't have been proud of myself. Okay. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm lowering my own standards for some shit bag, as you said earlier, that penetrated my soul that doesn't deserve. I shouldn't give him the respect to do that. And I the third... lie, in saying that, yeah, man, spell me. I'm gonna punch him in the face. I'm just gonna throw that out there. That, that's you know the worst things, and this is where, and that's where, but this is me now at 16 and at 18. I didn't do that when they were doing the racism. I didn't. At that point, it was like, yo, you were saying that shit, and I was gonna leave the country. Mm. That was what I was going to do now. And but there's, and that's why I said, for me, and we all got different lines. You know what I'm saying? I honestly believe that there's sometimes, my faith is massive. And you know, God say that boy, they slap you on the cheek, slap them back on the other cheek. That's how it is. Some people may say they want to turn the cheek. I'm off that point now. But you cross a line. So we've all got a line, do you know what I'm saying? So, but your wife, your kids, you know there's a line. It doesn't matter how much yeah. you're like, but somebody steps in, you go, I feel at that, he got to learn never to do, do that shit again. That's me, like, you get, but, that's me speaking to you now as a 39 year old mm. that like, yo, I would do it. So, and the reason why I, I, I came back to that because I think some people, what we really forget, we really forget how important we are. So when I say what's important to you, I always believe you've got to concentrate how important you are. So all them other people that's important to you, mums, sister, job, wife, everything you want to give them, if you are not right, mentally and physically, all those people that you care and love for, you won't be able to give them all that you want. Yeah. So when it comes back to that in the sense of, yo, what's important to you? People forget how important they are as individuals are. That's why I keep coming back to along your journey and you are that one common denominator and it falls. And there'll be times you pull on your shoulders. You're like, no, I've got this. I'm not tired. No, I've got this. I have to be strong. I've got... And there's going to be elements that you have to do it, but that's how important you are. So your wife can have what, what it is she wants. Your mumsy can smile, your sister, and that, your children. Okay, to that, so as individuals, you as an individual, and this is for everybody, you know, I've got to put as much as everything else is important to you, 
you as an individual have to be, if not number one, I'd listen, I'll put number one on that list. And that's not being selfish. That's just taking that time to be able to check in on you. 100%. Physically and mentally. Yeah, you, know you, can't, I mean? you can't neglect yourself because yeah. you can't give to others if you don't give to yourself. You can't give to yourself. You mentioned about the man in the mirror. Well, when you were talking about... Um, you were talking... What did you say earlier? What, what, what phrase did you use about not trying to prove others wrong, proving yourself right? I thought, like, the man in the mirror is the one person you want to prove right. You want to... Yeah. You do right by him yeah. or her if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're female. Yeah. And George Grove said something to me recently. He said... Um, when he first fight for Frotch, he has unwavering self-belief where right? he knew he was going to win that fight. He didn't, unfortunately, for him, but he thought he was going to win the fight. He had unwavering self-belief. And he said he wasted a lot of energy in that first fight with Frotch. He wasted a lot of energy trying to convince others he was going to win. So the whole build-up, he was like just doing everything he possibly could to try to convince others he was going to win. And then when he got older, he was like... He got more. He got more belief in himself. I guess he was more comfortable in his own skin. He was like, I haven't got to prove anybody shit. Like I got, I got to prove myself. Yeah, it's all that matters. Like, yeah. what's the point in proving, wasting the energy and wasting time proving people that I'm gonna win when I can just be focused on myself and do it? Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's a really good point, man. Looking after yourself and 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 it's, and. It's, you know when, and there's been times in, um, sometimes you have to say your point, and I always bring it back to football. Let's say a manager's not playing me, and I'm like, yo, watch. Like, just give me the opportunity, innit? Like, and then you, it goes past, and then... But sometimes you have to back yourself, and you go see him, and you... I, I think if you're constantly saying it every day, you're trying to convince yourself. Mm -hmm. I think there's times where you've got to be like, yo, Gaffer, listen, trust me, put me in. Trust me. Once that is, then... Then it's about, but I ain't got then go tell my strike partner and then the defender yeah. and then the CEO and that. And what, then, then I just need reinsurance. Yeah. Uh, that's what I believe. Which is a weakness, that, right? Which, which is, is which is uh, not saying it's a weakness because, uh, like, what I've learned, right? I've learned that some people, some people's characters are different. Some people need that. Yo, man, that self reinsurance, that that outside reinsurance. Sorry, like you know, gas me up, get, like tell me I'm the greatest, tell me I'm the great. Some people need that, and it, and this is what I keep saying about being comfortable with who you are. Find out what you need, find out what drives you, find out what motivates you. I say to young kids, and I think I heard this as a youngster, but if it's money, if it's a house, if it's cars, if it's clothes, but I've pinned that shit, pin mm -hmm. it up. That's what drives me. Be like, yo. I didn't you said? Uh, didn't you say in your book that I think a manager, one of your managers, told you that to pin yeah. up the uh, pin yeah, up yeah, the? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it was one of my. I think it was one of my managers that uh, said that back at um, BMW, and I was yeah. like X five or something. So that was what I wanted an X five. I wanted it when it came out. I thought it was an all purpose car. It was all purpose. I was like, yo, I'm getting that. Yeah, pin that. If that's what if that's what's going to drive you to go and go a bit above and beyond, do it. Did you get the X5 I in the end? I got the X5, yeah, so, yeah. So what happens, okay, so in your book, you talk about at one point in your career, <laughs> you and your brother chucked in 1,500 quid yeah. and you shared a Punto. Yeah. You shared a... Good you shared, you shared, <laughs> People don't know about that Punto. If I could find that Punto, it was a jade green Punto. It was manual. Ooh, it was the <laughs> shit, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the Punto, to share on a car with your brother, the Fiat Punto, 1,500 quid, um, to the X5. From that to that, talk to me. What happens? Like, what does it take to get from... Because that's what people want to hear. Like, people listen to you, listen to me. They want to be inspired. They need inspiration. They're coming to us for inspiration. What does it take to take you from that Punto to the X5? Hard work and belief. Yeah. That's what it takes. Like, the, the, when people... Like, nothing... And uh, Most people out there that has gone through a story from A to B... And A is where they started and B is where they wanted to be. It wasn't handed. That's most. Some people may have won a lot of X, Y, but most of them have grinded for it. Yeah. And that's period. There's no... Nobody just turn around and say, yeah, yeah, just turn up and be you. It's a lie. We all know that. And I don't care if it's a cameraman, a chef, a teacher. Nobody has just turned up and got it. They've grinded. Every single person that's wanted to achieve something has grinded. That's exactly... and. But then there's characteristics that you have as an individual. You know what I'm saying? I, me and him bought this car because... I don't know if I put it in my book. Maybe I did. But I remember we wanted to go out on a night out uh, when we were young. 
and we asked our brethren to come pick us up. And he was like, nah, man, this man can't be asked, man, like, bun that. Or he said something where it was like, brother, I hate being the only one with a car, or something to the point where it made me and my brother feel like we was begging for him to come pick us up. That was when we was like, nah, man, yo, bro, we got to go get our own shit. We put 1,500, got it. Next thing was, we get, and you use people. I keep saying, brother, you show me your circle and I'll show you where you're going to be in five years. Me and my brother, me and my brothers, but my older one at the time, then I was like, all right, cool, I want to go get a Renault McGann convertible. He was like, there's no way my younger brother's going to leave me. He bought a Renault McGann convertible. And we saw that because we saw two twins get matching cars. So everywhere out there, there's motivations that you can use. Some people use it as they'll see some people and hate. Me, I want to be able to see you do things and be like, but how did you do that? Because I want to get there. Mm. That's how it was. And then and we that's shown on. through from your personality, yeah, mate. Yeah, I, I mean... Go on. No, I was going to say, I went through a time in my career when I injured my eye and I had to retire from boxing, but I spent, I had three years and nine surgeries and th over three years to try right. to get my career back. And unfortunately, I couldn't get it back. And in that period, I was so jealous and I was so bitter. And I regret that. I wasted three years of my life just being jealous, bitter and angry. And it made me a worse person. Yeah. I had to kind of hit rock bottom to build myself back up again. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm very happy where I'm at in my life. I'm back to where I, where I should be. But with you, like, you've always been somebody that's been happy for people for doing well. Yeah, but the reason why I'm saying that, right, I'm like, I, I was always comfortable. And you know what I learned as well? I think going broke was my biggest lesson. I broke my leg at Swansea, um, then got... Uh, Jill and them came in, said they'll double my money. I was like, oh, shit, yeah, yeah, boom. Stupid. And you look back at it now when the club wants to give you a contract, even though you've got a broken leg, I should have snapped the hand of it. But I was driven by money. At that time, I was driven by money. So anyway, I turned the contract down and then Jill and them took the contract away. So I was broke. So I didn't have... I wasn't earning for six months. So you burnt through my savings after maybe two, three months. And then it was that realisation being like, raw. first I was paycheck to paycheck and that it can change real quick. So for myself was like, but oh, you know what, but can I be hating a man that's got money? I was like, well, strip the money away. I'm still the same individual. You know what I'm saying? It, the only difference was I just had a daughter. So there wasn't even time to feel sorry for myself. I was like, yo, B, you got to get back up there. You got to get back out there. And that was my, that was, that was my driving, my driving force was my daughter. I won't know, I didn't have a time to be bitter. I didn't have no time to hate. Yeah. Um, and then for me, I, it all keeps coming back to, like, I've always been blessed in my lane. You know what I'm saying? There ain't no shame being in your financial lane. And I think that in society now, it's, we're very much of a clout, you know, you know, they, they, put to what they've got on their feet, what, they, what watches yeah. they wear. You know what I'm saying? That's what gives them joy. But once you're comfortable with you, and that's what, for me, it comes back to, it literally comes back to that comfortability with you as an individual. For me, what's the point of hating? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, energy is contagious. So if you put positive energy out there, by the grace of God, you'll get positive energy back. Just to wrap it up, so you're... How did you deal with, as a, as a kid, as a youngster, you got released or... Not just released, but you got rejected by so many different clubs. Yeah. Like, so many, and this is really important because I want people to listen to this and learn from this because we all get rejected. Yeah. How did you keep, like, picking yourself back up off the floor? Because many people would have went, do you know what? Look, I don't look like a typical footballer. People judge me before they even get to see me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe my uh, people are maybe intimidated by my personality because you're so... Loud yeah, and yeah. big, yet positive, but still yeah, people yeah, can be parked by that. Course. What made like a lot of people, most people after suffering, I'm not like of eight, nine, ten, twelve, fifteen, you've been rejected by so many clubs. Why do you stick at it? All right, two, funny enough, it's about the intimidation. I remember speaking about this, and I remember I, I'm, I wasn't always as loud as this because I actually took in, I acknowledged I'm a big boy. So I rarely used to get angry because I was thinking, oh, I'm a big black brother, so if I get angry, I'll have that whole, he's got a chip on his shoulder. So not that I used to suppress, I was always me, but I'd be like, chat, man, and bunnies, I just, I just let it ride off my shoulder. But it's funny, because I mentioned character traits um, earlier on, and I was, call it stubborn, I was stubborn from young. And when I say that, I say that to the point where 
I, I remember playing football. My brother's three years older than me, so I must have been five, let's say six, five, six. So he would have been eight, nine. And I used to, I played in my brother's, his, his year. And I remember hearing from his... This is uh, Yemi. This is Yemi, yeah, my older brother. And I remember his friends, they were arguing to get me on their team. And this is a five, six-year-old. It's like, no, no, like, little B's on my team, little B's on my... Yemi's like, no, nah, man, my brother's on my team. And little... So and I remember thinking, oh, shit, like... Boy, I can ball. And I, I knew this anyway. I'd made that decision after that anyway. But what had happened, as I got an older, just loved the game. Like, everywhere I would play, there was football. That's all I did. That's all that you saw me with the football. Didn't care about anything else. Everywhere you I told went, me you weren't even into girls. I wasn't even like, into, I, I wasn't football into, was your thing. I wasn't into females. I wasn't into, in the sense where I didn't care. I used to have holy crap, I'm like, proper. Like, I, I, was, I was that dude where, but as long as there was a football, I was good. That was it. Um, and so then, as you grow older, just playing for, you know, I played for the district. I played for um, my play centre. I uh, played for local teams. And I kid you not, and this is not arrogance, I was better than them. Like, like this, this is not, I wasn't, this is not fronting. I was better than my age group. I was better than, I was bigger than them, I was strong. I was better than my age group. So I remember when the first rejection happened, and it's funny because I remember, I remember getting the manager, and I remember he made a statement. He's like, "Yo, you're the best player I've seen like in my life." And I remember hearing that, but you don't take that in because I thought that myself. I'm like, "Yo, I'm, I'm a baller." So where did that come from? That that belief in yourself at such a young age. I, it, you know what it come from? It come from my surroundings. So it came from my brother. He was my my older brother was my competition. Yeah. He was my competition. I wanted to be better than him. He was the pedestal. If he, been, if he wanted to play football, there's a line I put in my book. I call him a donut. Like, he would have been that guy. Like, I, the only difference with me and him, and we've got the character, he's a functional individual. Like, does his job, he's functional. I was always about that, je ne sais quoi. I liked that whole, st I liked to be able to, that was, so I would have seen what he was at, and then I would want to been like, yeah, but I need to put my sauce on it. But he was my guy that I was like, all right, cool. And in my head, I'm like, so if I'm, I, I was far off him, but in my head, I'm like, if I keep in touching distance with him, he's three years my senior. So my age group, I'll dump on my age group. I wasn't even looking at my age group. I was like, if I can catch my brother, then I'm, so that's what it was. So I was always up against my brother and he's man -nims. So I was, So when I played with my age group, I was like, oh, this is, this is light work. So then when a manager told me, you know what, have you got ability? Because that, it was there to be seen. Like, yeah, but I just don't know. And I remember hearing that. And I, at the time, I was like, you must be bantering. Like, that was literally, anybody that knows, my mum would say, I was like, this man must be bantering. But the crazy thing is, and like I said, I can put it into words now. I remember thinking, hold on, this is my dream. But how am I going to allow anybody who comes into my life on a temporary basis and give him permanent aspirations on my life. But I, and this is the crazy thing I try and tell people, but if I meet you for a year and my, let's say, let's say football's 15 years, so I've known you for a year, and then at the end of the year, you say, yeah, I'm not good enough. I'm going to allow that you just know me for a year for my 15 years. But, and, and that's, that, it never computed to me. So, and when you go for trials, it's generally three days max. So I was like, wait, hold on. You, I'm going to allow you to say no for my dream and you've only met me once. And that was constantly. And I'd go back with the man names, I'd play, and I'd win tournaments. But it wasn't that I wasn't good. I knew I was good. I just didn't fit. Their, their, what they perception as a player. Who taught you that? Who instilled that in you? That, that... Parents. Parents. Like, Nigerian upbringing. And one thing I remember, I was never scared of hard work. I saw my mum and dad leave work for 7 o'clock a.m., get back in at 10 o'clock. I was never scared of hard work. My parents installed, I see my pops, get back in at 10 o'clock, then do cabin, 3 o'clock. Then I was never scared of hard work. That was it. And it was like, and they did whatever it took to make us. Like, it wasn't, we weren't blessed with crep in the sense of we didn't have name brands. This is when... Boy, if you wore Nike, you was the man, whereas now everybody wears Nike. But Nike and them name brands, but it cost at them mm. times. We never had that. But I remember my parents always said, listen, like, we'd always, we'd always won't go without. But if there's something you want, tell me January, 
They'll use little words. I can't remember the other catalogues there, but you can spend a year. And then by Christmas times, we got our gifts. So they paid it off bit by bit. But as, as a kid, you never clock this, in it. You're just like, oh, I want it and I want it yesterday. But I can't ever go back looking where we went without. But I knew my parents worked. And that's the... Cr I, I knew. I knew because we'd play football downstairs and we'd know the headlights of their car coming down and... By the time the car comes down, we run up the stairs to get back in the house. So we, I knew they worked for the day. Mm. And that was installed. It was like, yo, you want something, but if you've got to work, nothing's handed. I remember yeah. my parents saying that nothing is handed. Yeah. And that's what it was. So I was like, yo, I'm going to be a footballer. And I remember one thing is, like I keep saying, and I, I'll say this now, I wanted to prove myself right. My parents were big on university. Made my older sister and my older brother go to university. I was like, mum, I'm going to be a footballer. My mum's like, boy, this boy, this boy has decided he's headstrong. He's going to be a footballer. And that was probably at the time where it wasn't to prove myself. I like, oh, mum's, I'm going to be a footballer. I've said it. And that was the start. But I said it. I put it out there. So I was going to do it. Whatever it was, whatever form, I told my mum at 16, I'm going to sign for the Arsenal. It never happened. You know, the realisation, it never happened. But I had to go the journey of Lithuania, then to Barry Town, and then to make my step for the EFL. And then 22 years later, bam, mm. man it is. Mate, honestly, that's unbelievably, that's, that's inspiring. Right, that's, it's, it's, it's astonishing, it's inspiring. And I'm so proud to, to know you as a mate. I told you it was a good one. It was such a good one, Bayo. Thank you so much, mate, for coming on and sharing those experiences with me and, and the listeners here. Wow. It was, there was so, I've written some notes here on my phone. There was so much stuff. One thing I loved, he said, I remember, hold on, this is my dream. How am I going to allow someone to come into my life on a temporary basis and give a permanent aspirations on my life? I love that. I love that so much. And he's, he's dead right. Like, nobody can put a ceiling on us. Like, we shouldn't put ceilings on us. And I just... He speaks so much sense. And as I've said, he's... 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 He's, he's, he's rinsed every ounce of talent he has through hard work and, and dedication and belief. And when you see... If you've seen Bayo on the telly and on, on his social media, he's a fun-loving guy. He's got over a million followers on social media. He's fun. He's He seems like a guy that you can get to know. And he is that guy you can get to know. And oftentimes people think when you're like that, you don't work hard. No, he works hard. Look at him. Look at his physique. You only get that physique by working hard in the gym. And don't forget, he had that physique. 17 stone of pure muscle whilst being a professional footballer. He worked so hard. And I love how he related, how he, he, he works hard because he saw his mum and dad work hard. Typical Nigerian upbringing in, in London. He saw their work ethic and they instilled it upon him to work hard. There are so many nuggets of inspiration there. I'm not going to stop there because there's too many. And I asked him straight out. I, in his book, he talks about the Punto. Him and his brother put £1,500 each in to, to, share, to share a Punto. And he, the, the new BMW X5 came out and I asked him, like, like how did you get it? He said, through hard work and belief. And that's it. That is literally the secret to success. I go to primary schools all the time and I and I do my talks to, to, to the school kids. There's two things to be successful in life. You gotta work hard and you have to believe in yourself. The two things, and I try to instill that to kids, young, 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 because if you take that with you in your life, hard work and belief, you'll get anything you want. If you work hard, if you believe in yourself, you will get anything you want. You'll achieve anything you want. Bayo Akin Fenwa is living proof of that. If you work hard in life, if you believe in yourself, then nobody, no football managers, no racist fans in Lithuania, they can't put a ceiling on your success. And that's it. That is the end of season one. We ended with Bayo Akin Fenwa with a banging conversation. Thank you so much, Bayo. Season two starts next week. And it starts with me, the mic, the camera, talking openly, honestly, and as candidly as I always do. So if you've got a question that you want to know from me or from a previous guest, then shoot me a DM at Get Back Up Pod on Instagram. Get Back Up Pod, season two starts with me 
talking openly, honestly, about anything you want to know. So shoot me a DM, ask me a question, and season two is going to be a banger. <laughs>